Yeah, again, uh, children ages three to first grade uh, dismissed the children's church with their parents' permission, and we're glad for those who serve in that vital ministry. As we come to God's Word this morning, we're turning to Exodus 1, Exodus 1, and we are starting today on this first day of 2023, uh, a new sermon series. We are going to preach through the book of Exodus, uh, and we're going to largely do a a 30,000-foot view. Um, We're going to preach through the book of Exodus from um, today until Easter, so 13 weeks, 13 weeks, 40 chapters in 13 weeks. We're up to the challenge. We're going to get a great view of what God does in redeeming his people. Um, It was uh, uh, McGee, uh, J. Vernon McGee, I believe, that said that uh, Exodus is the story of uh, from gloom to glory, from gloom to glory, that we start out in this chapter where we start today uh, in a pretty dark place, and then we go through the book of uh, Exodus, seeing God's glory revealed and unfolded throughout that Uh, throughout this entire book, and then uh, at the very end, we get to see God's glory rest upon His people. And so uh, it's a great book of the Bible. Uh, The men's Bible study has been through it a couple of times, I think, uh, as Stu has led us through that. Um, But uh, we get to do that together now over the next several weeks. So let's let's turn our attention to God's Word. Exodus chapter 1, we're going to read the entire chapter. Uh, So here... Here we go. This is God's word. It is inspired and infallible. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel." So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dwelt dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. And this is the word of the Lord. Father, as we come to your word, May our hearts be humble before you. May we submit ourselves 
to the work of the Spirit as you work through your word to bring us the truth, to tell us again in our hearts the truth about who you are and about the great and amazing and wonderful work of our Savior Jesus Christ in bringing redemption and rescue to his people. O Lord God, would you work mightily in us this morning and may may what we learn today, may what we know today be lived out in our lives. May it be uh, something that bears much fruit for your kingdom. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It was uh, probably <clears throat> in my early high school years or maybe uh, late middle school uh, when I got, uh, on a, I got fixated on uh, Harry Houdini. Uh, I, I just, I read two or three or four different um, uh, biographies uh, about Harry Houdini and how he got out of all these amazing and incredible uh, places where he put himself, where he willingly subjected himself to water and chains and straight jackets and all manner of things. And I just, I loved reading about him. I loved reading about how he was able to do all these incredible things. Well, that interest in uh, Harry Houdini bled over into some of the other biographies I read as a young man in, in high school or middle school, and uh, one of those was about Harriet Tubman, uh, the, the amazing woman who uh, first escaped slavery herself and then became instrumental in leading many, many other slaves to find escape from slavery. Uh, and then not only uh, Harriet Tubman, but uh, one of my favorite movies from about the same time was uh, The Great Escape. Uh, the Great Escape. Steve McQueen, one of the greatest roles I think he ever played. And, and just a terrific movie, uh, especially the motorcycle scene uh, where he jumps the fence and rides off into the sunset. Uh, or not quite. But uh, anyway, Great Escapes. We, we have, this, we have a, 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 an interest in that, don't we? We have a, a, a longing to, to see people set free, to see uh, these, these uh, people that are captive to regain their freedom. And it's uh, that idea of escape that we want to look at today as we start thinking about uh, this idea of exodus, this idea of escape, this idea of exit, freedom, deliverance. Uh, that's the theme that we find throughout the book of Exodus. And um, I think one of the things that, that uh, we, we must confront ourselves with as we come to a passage like this is our own proclivity toward escape. Our own desire to be free of the difficult things of this world, to not have to feel them, um, as you look back over 2022, I'm sure you'll have many tremendous memories of what 2022 held for you and for your family. You'll have uh, lots of memories of, of family and friends and, and fun and food and all those good things. Uh, but then also, as you look back at 2022, I'm sure you'll have some moments that might bring tears to your eyes or uh, that sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach. Oh yeah, that, that was quite miserable. That was hard. Um, and then as you think about this year, 2023, uh, what, what are you anticipating more of? The, the triumphs or the tragedies? Well, if it's the triumphs, then you're, uh, you're, you're in luck. Because God is going to give you many of those. God is going to give you many times where you are going to do, uh, you're going to come to new realizations of who he is and how much he loves you and what he's done in your life and is doing in your life to, to show you his blessing. The other side will happen as well, won't it? We'll, we'll go through difficulties. We'll go through hard times in this new year. Some of the, some of the difficulties that we're experiencing now will follow us into the new year. Some of the afflictions and temptations and opposition that we face uh, will, will be there. And so what do you do when you, when you encounter those things? What's your go-to? What's your, what's your go-to escape? 
Uh, many people get lost in a, in a really good page turner, really good murder mystery or a, 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 a drama, right? A, a novel that they read every night every, and they get lost and they can't put it down. Uh, others of us might turn to, uh, to, to movies or to, uh, or to alcohol or to drugs. Uh, those kinds of things happen in not, not just out there in, in the rest of Tucson with those people. No, they happen in here with us, with these people, with our friends, with our family members. We seek escape. We, we look for ways to escape. We look for ways to not feel. I mean, some of the things that we've gone through in the last year or that you've gone through, um, you're tired of feeling them. You just want to be numb for a bit. You want to escape. The story of Exodus is a story of escape. It's a story of exit. It's a story of deliverance, and this book of the Bible is critical for us to know and review and understand because it is our story. It's the story of deliverance. It's the story of the Bible. It's, it's what the Bible is all about. We are stuck. We are enslaved. We are held captive, but God does not forget us. God has not forgotten you, and that is the main point for Exodus 1. Here is the idea that we're to get and to take heart from this stage-setting chapter is that God's people, under God's rule, know God's blessing even under cruel oppression. God's people, under God's rule, know God's blessing even under cruel oppression. That's something for us to take with us. That's a faith builder. That's a statement that's true about our God and what he's done for us. And it's a statement, it's a truth that we, we enfold into our lives, we take heart in. And we come back to over and over throughout the, the, the coming weeks and months and the year. That as God's people, we are under his rule. We are under his care. And that he is with us in the darkest of times, in the valley of the shadow of death. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. So think about what's, uh, what's going on here in Exodus. The, the Hebrew people find themselves in circumstances that they could not anticipate and uh, they could not control. Does that sound familiar? I mean, think back uh, three years. It, it's even weird to think it's been three years since January of 2020. But none of us knew what 2020 was going to hold for us. I mean, we're still feeling the effects of that, right? This, this uh, taking up of the offering was something we stopped in the middle of COVID, and now we've reinstituted it, and we're all getting used to, oh, yeah, I gotta, I'm supposed to bring something with me to church. Yeah, I'm, it, Just the ramifications of, of uh, the whole COVID experience are still with us, still going on, still continuing. Um. The Hebrew people here in Exodus find themselves uh, as a growing minority, uh, increasing in numbers and might. Does that sound familiar? That's, that's a picture of the church. That's a picture of the church worldwide. Uh, if, you, if you think about um, and you uh, follow missions, activities around the globe, we know that uh, the church is growing by leaps and bounds in many, many places around the globe. We may, we may feel here in the United States and, and in Europe uh, that, that Christianity is diminishing the, the number of churches that are closing or growing and growing. The number of empty cathedrals and, and churches in, in Europe and America are growing exponentially as pastors leave the ministry, as uh, churches fold, as people just stop going to church. So we might feel that here, and yet we ought to know that that's not the case. That's not the reality of the church around the globe. That the church around the globe is growing, and God is blessing it. It is multiplying in the face of persecution. These Hebrews, in living in the land of Egypt, 
had become a threat to the king of Egypt. And so he took drastic action. Again, this uh, might sound familiar, maybe not so much to us yet, but uh, there will be a time where the opposition grows so much that we will have to outwardly, publicly face some sorts of uh, persecution and oppression and, and respond to that. All of these things are familiar to us because this is our story. This is the story of the church throughout the ages. And uh, we can't be too uh, chronologically smug or confident in saying, oh, this is different, we're going to do different. No, we're going to be just like the church has been. We're going to suffer, we're going to struggle, we're going to have great triumphs and great joys, and uh, God will carry us through all of it. God will be with us. God will deliver us uh, because He is our escape. He is our hiding place. We'll come back to that in just a bit. But the things I want you to see as we go through this passage, we're going to take uh, just the, the three paragraphs as you see them in your Bible, um, and we're going to think about what God is doing as uh, he's teaching us about this idea of his presence, his power in the midst of our oppression. So the first thing is, the first point is that God's people flourish even in a foreign land. God's people flourish even in a foreign land. Uh, this opening paragraph of Exodus connects us back, doesn't it? It connects us back to Genesis, to the story of the patriarchs, the stories of uh, the people of God ending up in Egypt. And then we're given this uh, brief genealogy of the descendants of, uh, of Jacob, uh, verses 1 through 5. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, all the descendants of Jacob, were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. <clears throat> so, um, Kevin, can you take that slide down? So here's the first question on your Exodus quiz. There, there will be a quiz. Uh, at the end of the sermon, at the end of the whole series. So uh, you'll get graded on that and get seated in the sanctuary according to, you know, <clears throat> you'll all want to be in the back. Um, so here, here's, the, here's the first question on the quiz. Can you name all 12 of the tribes of Israel? I just read them twice. They're there, right? So uh, Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah and uh, Donner and Blitzen, <laughs> Rudolph, Grumpy, no. So they're they're here though. This this is the this is the this, this is something you should you should know. It's not it's not super important. You're not going to be asked it um, at work on on Monday uh, tomorrow. Nobody's going to ask you of the twelve tribes of Israel. But this is something you should be familiar with. We ought to know these things. These are important things. These are important people in the history of God's church. Um, now, the, the other things you can prepare for, the other questions on the quiz that are coming up in the coming weeks, uh, name, name the ten plagues in order. Uh, I think you can get the last one. That's, that one's a given. You should get number ten. But... Uh, you should be able to name, name the plagues. Um, name the Ten Commandments. That, that's going to be a little bit later. We're going to come back to that, but that's going to be on the quiz. Um, what about uh, the furnishings of the tabernacle? Can you name the furnishings of the tabernacle? Okay, by the end of the series, you'll be able to answer all of those questions really well. Because this is the story of us. This is our story. This is our history. And actually, we should be really clear about this. We're, we're going we're gonna to encounter <clears throat> the, the people that we would expect that you should know, right? You, you know that we're going to encounter Moses. Uh, the, the next sermon from this series will be about Moses, the deliverer that God raises up. So uh, you're going to encounter Moses. You're going to encounter Pharaoh. You're going to encounter the people of Israel. You're going to encounter uh, Aaron, and uh, you're going to encounter the, the golden calf. You're going to encounter 
uh, Nadab and Abihu. You're going to encounter all these people, but the story is God's story. He's the, he's, he's the central character. He is the main character in all of his stories, in all of the Bible. None, none of the stories about Moses or, or Aaron uh, matter apart from God. And so that's, that's what I want you to understand. That's what I want you to know, that God is the central character of this story. All of the sons of Egypt, or uh, of, of uh, Jacob, came to, to Egypt. All of the sons of Jacob ended up there. They all lived there. They, there were 12 tribes. Uh, these guys were not super great guys, right? Um, Judah is the highly prized one. Because Reuben and Simeon and Levi screwed up. They messed up. They did not follow God's will. They were overlooked. And so Judah is the one who stands out among the children of Israel, of Egypt, or excuse me, of Jacob. Uh, these guys were, uh, many of them were scoundrels. They, they cheated, they killed, they maimed. Um, and yet God preserves them. And Verse 5 tells us that there were 70 of them in all, 70 of the children of Jacob. Uh, this is the same number of nations that are listed earlier back in Genesis chapter 10, right before the Tower of Babel. There were 70 nations that are named there. If you go back and you look at the genealogy in Genesis chapter 10, you see 70 nations, and here you have 70 people. And what we see here is a continuation of God distilling down his people, saving a remnant of all of the people of the earth. That those who, uh, who lived prior to the Tower of Babel, and uh, they, that they were the ones who were trying to set the agenda for what humanity would look like. That humanity was, uh, was able to be on their own and, and surpass what God could do, becoming gods to themselves. Well, the people of Israel, the people of Jacob, the, the ones that ended up in Egypt, well, they, they thought many of the same things, and yet God brought them out of that. God saved them from themselves and delivered them to be his people that would follow after him. So we find the, uh, the descendants of Jacob uh, who make up this one family of, of people, this one people that God has chosen to be his. Uh, and, and then verse 6 kind of lays a little bit of a heavy on us. It says, then Joseph died, and all his brothers and all that generation. That whole generation was gone. Uh, I came from a family of uh, eight kids. My dad came from a family of 12 kids. Uh, when, when that generation died, which the last one just passed away a few, few years ago, when that generation died, there was a, there was a, a kind of a, a loss of, of protection that I felt, or a loss of covering. This, this older generation, these, the, the patriarchs and matriarchs of the Cruz family were gone. And now it was upon us, it was upon the next generation to continue to raise our children after the Lord and to, to seek God and to walk in His ways. But that that generation that led us had passed away and that's that's what the the feeling we tend to get or ought to get as we read those words is that that there's uh this is a new start a new beginning and yet there's some caution to it there's some concern to it because that generation was gone and then we find out well pharaoh there, there's a new pharaoh in town as well and uh, he does not know that generation at all. He doesn't know them. He doesn't, he doesn't have the same regard for them. And so the oppression will begin to mount. Uh, Joseph and all of his brothers and all that generation died. Uh, and then verse 7 says, But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. The people of Israel flourished, and the land was filled. They multiplied. Uh, we have, we have those, that recurring idea, that recurring theme from Genesis where God told Abraham and told 
Isaac and told Jacob to, to fill the earth and subdue it, right? He told that to Noah after Noah came back to rest after the flood. Uh, he told that to Adam and Eve. So we have this line going back all the way back to Adam and Eve of multiplying and flourishing and filling the land. And now they're doing it. They're filling this land. And then uh, verse 13, the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring, oh, this is going back to Genesis 15, sorry, Genesis 15, 13, that know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. What, what God did not tell Abram was that though his offspring would be sojourners in a land that was not theirs, that they would be servants there and that they would be afflicted for 400 years, that they would flourish. They would grow under the affliction. And that's exactly what the people of God did. And it's what we do. It's in times of trial and temptation and affliction that we grow the most. It's in those times of oppression, those times, those times where we're afflicted, where we really grow. I think I've shared with you before, it's one of my favorite illustrations of this idea, and that, that is that um, when, when a mother giraffe has a baby giraffe, she'll lick, lick him off, clean him up, and then she'll begin to start nudging him to get him to stand up on his little spindly legs. And as soon as that giraffe, that little baby giraffe stands up, what does the mom do? Knocks him down. Knocks the little baby down and then begins nudging him again to get up. And what she's doing is training him from the moment of birth to be able to escape, to be able to get away from the predators. And it's through that affliction, it's through that, that knocking him down that he gets stronger and that's how God treats us. That's what God does for us in our afflictions. That's why we can take such confidence in the verses like Romans 8, 28, right? One of our favorite verses where God works together for good, works together for good those things that, that people need, that, that the goodness, the, the ultimate good that we need to have come out of the afflictions. Those who've been called according to his purposes, he brings good from everything that we encounter, especially the trials, especially the difficulties. They're not meant to be run away from. He is meant to be run to in the midst of our affliction. We're not to escape the afflictions. We're to hide in him, to find our hiding place in him. So, God's people flourish even though they're in a foreign land, and God's people are afflicted under a foreign rule. This next paragraph is, is a tough paragraph to read. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Uh, a new king, and I'm sure the Egyptians, the Israelites, and anyone else living there was asking the same questions. What would he be like? What would this new king be? be like? Would he be better than the last one? Will, will we prosper under his rule? Will he protect us from harm? Uh, the fact that he did not know Joseph was not a good sign. Who didn't know Joseph? Who didn't know about the story of, of uh, salvation that he worked by uh, following the guidelines that God gave him and the, the visions that he saw, the dreams that he saw to, to store food during those seven fat years, so that when the seven thin years came, people would survive, people would be alive. And it was that plan that, was, that brought about the salvation of many. Many people were saved because of Joseph's following of God's commands. Who didn't know that story? This king should have known the story, at least, if he didn't know Joseph. But apparently, this king did not. Uh, verses 9 through 11 tell us that the new king is, is fearful and the growing numbers of uh, Israelites and their strength was a threat to him. Uh, they could prove to be a terrible force if they were allied with their enemies, right? He's fearful. In fact, it says that um, he, he, they bring, uh, Moses brings up the word escape here in verse 10. Uh, if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land, 
the idea of escape. So what, is, what does the Pharaoh do? What does the king do? Well, he, he treats them poorly. He oppresses them. Uh, therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. Um, the uh, uh, verse, verses 13 and 14, if you read those, I mean, just, just listen again to how, it's, how Moses describes this affliction. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. And just in case you missed it, he says it again, in all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. They were ruthless. The, the Egyptians were ruthless towards God's, God's people, making them work as slaves, putting, putting the pressure on, taking away their hope, trying to make sure that they would fail, that they would falter, that they would dim, diminish rather than increase. And they wanted them to slink home, stay in Goshen, be, be easy, be easy on us, right? And then... Uh, Instead, they multiplied and spread out. And so we come then to, uh, to verse 12. And verse 12a is, uh, is going to be the theme verse for our church for 2023. Uh, it's been our practice over the last several years to take a, a verse from the passage that I preach on on the first Sunday of the year and take that verse and use it as the theme verse for the year. And so Mark and I were talking through this passage the other day, and, and we landed on this verse, the first half of, of verse 12. And listen to what it says. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. So as God's people living in a foreign land, the more they were oppressed the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. That is, that is what we believe is a great verse for us to, to memorize and to think about and to meditate upon throughout this new year as we come into the new year and as we go through the whole year. That as we face oppression, God would use that to multiply us and to spread us abroad. Um, Hide, hide this verse in your heart. Personalize it. You're going to hear it over and over again throughout the year, but we want you to understand that as, as the oppression mounts, as the persecution mounts, God will multiply his people, and God will care for his people and cause us to spread about, to flourish. Um, it, it might be good to ask the question as we think about this verse, um, what, what is he going to multiply it says that uh, the, the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. Well, the natural thought is to think, well, they multiplied in numbers of people. And I think that's the simplest and basic, most basic and correct answer. It, they multiplied in the number of people. They continued to grow. They continued to have babies, which is what the last, last paragraph is about. But we can also think about it this way, and I think it may be helpful for you as, as a follower of Christ heading into this new year, considering the oppression that may come your way, that you consider that possibly part of what this verse is getting at and the multiplication is getting at is that not only is it the number of people, but it's, it's the number of prayers that God's people lift up, that the the prayers of God's people would be multiplied so that uh, the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied their prayers, the more they sought God out, the more they went to God. Isn't that what we're called to do is rather than escape, to come to him in utter dependence? And that's what prayer is. Prayer is, is a, uh, an act of dependence. It's saying, I'm weak, you are strong, I have nothing, you have everything, I'm going to come to you for all that I need. I'm going to seek you out so that when the oppression mounts, the, multi the prayers are multiplied. And not just the prayers. So it's, it's people that are multiplied, it's prayers that are multiplied, but it's also uh, that the purposes of God are revealed. The purposes of God are, are brought to fruition. That as the uh, oppression uh, grows, that 
that the, uh, the purposes of God are multiplied as we spread abroad and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those in our lives. If we know who to run to when we're oppressed, don't you think your friends and family members need to know that as well? Isn't that what we're called to do is to share with others the great hiding place, the great escape, the greatest escape, which is Jesus himself. And so as, as uh, oppression cr- comes, we multiply, we multiply in numbers, we multiply our prayers, we multiply God's purposes as each one of us then goes out, spreads abroad, and shares the good news of Jesus Christ with those who are in darkness, those who are, st- who are still in oppression but don't know a way out, are seeking all kinds of other ways out. People of Israel suffered under the oppression of the Egyptians and of this new king, and yet God was with them. God called, called, caused them to multiply and to thrive. And that's the third thing that we see here in this, uh, in this passage, in this opening chapter of this great story, that God's people thrive while under the threat of harm. We see that happen right here with the, with the Israelites. Excuse me. The final verse of this chapter brings us back to what we learned in the opening paragraph. That when the pressure is applied to God's people, what comes, what comes gushing out is more kids, more might, more threat to the oppressors. Um, I saw someone uh, a couple weeks ago take a bite into a jelly donut. And it just went right out the side. All the jelly squirted out the side. It's that kind of pressure that I think we're meant to think of when we think about uh, the pressure that's applied to God's people, that when the pressure is applied, something's going to come out. What's going to come out? What's going to come out as the pressure is applied to your life? Well, here's the thing. If If we're trying to get out entirely escaping numbing, getting, getting away from that oppression, that affliction, if we're trying to remove ourselves from it, then, then not much is going to come out when the pressure is applied. We won't have a witness. Our prayers won't be multiplied. We're just going to escape because we're stopping the, the, the hurt. We're stopping the pain. But the pain and the hurt are meant to, to, to drive us to Christ, Not to drive us away from Christ, not to drive us away from each other, not to drive us away from the body, which is, again, one of our tendencies is to to isolate, right? It's to to be alone in our suffering, in our hurting. But we're to flee to Christ, we're to flee to the body of Christ. We're we're to please God, we're to seek God and and to fear God. And that's that's what we see in these uh, midwives, right? It's an amazing part of the story. The, the king of Egypt tells them uh, if an if a, if a Israelite woman is giving birth and it's a boy, kill him. Uh, what a terrible, what a terrible thing for anybody to say about another human being, to kill another human being. It's not his place. God is the one who gives life. God is the one who takes life away. But this king, this one who... <clears throat> Uh, does not know Joseph, does not know the God of Joseph, makes this horrible command to these midwives. And the midwives, the midwives stand up under it. The midwives fear God more than they fear man. They, they're willing to suffer. They're willing to die. If that's what the king of, uh, of Egypt would have done, they would have been, yes, off with our heads. We get it. We didn't obey you. But we obeyed a higher authority. And this is where we begin to see uh, the, the God, the one true living God, do battle with the gods of Egypt. This is where we begin to see it unfold. Pharaoh considers himself God. And he's, he's, uh, he takes himself to be one who can take away life. He can order the taking of life. That he, he is in the place of God Almighty. And we're going to see over the next few weeks how that's utterly ridiculous, and he gets put in his place. But the affliction that God's people go through, they, it, it, it brings about a, a thriving, a greater attention upon God, a greater dependence upon God. 
<clears throat> so, uh, consider these things. I'm not going to go much more into the midwives. Uh, if you have questions about whether God approved of their lying or not, then um, discuss that amongst yourselves at lunch today and tell me what you came up with. <clears throat> God commends them for their behavior. God commends them for saving these children. Um, we know that for sure. So as we, come, as we come to the end of the story, as we come to the, the conclusion, <clears throat> what, gives us, what gives us the hope of finding escape? What, what gives us the hope of finding escape in Christ? Why, why would we go to Christ? Why is that... Why is that ultimately where we go when we read this passage from Exodus? Well, we, we stand on this side of the cross, don't we? we? We have the benefit of being able to look back where, where these, these Israelites were only able to look forward. They had, they had some oral tradition, some oral uh, command, and um, oral, uh, the oral tradition gave them the gospel that God would send a deliverer. God would send one from the seed of the woman who had crushed the head of the seed of the serpent. They had these promises, but they didn't have much to go on. We have this benefit of being able to look back and to see their history, but also uh, everything that's taken place after the cross. And so what do we find in Jesus? What do we, what do we understand in him? Well, first, uh, I, I love this passage from the Psalms, Psalm 32. It's been such a help for me uh, in, in the last two or three years, uh, as I personally have sought escape from uh, many of the troubles of these last few years, uh, this verse ha- has, has held me close to the Lord. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. And the you there is God Almighty, it's Yahweh, and it's His Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, we are able to find our deliverance in Him. We are to, to pursue Him, to, to look to Him, to flee to Christ, who is our deliverer. <clears throat> if you turn with me to Luke chapter 9, uh, there's a passage there that in your Bibles will be called the Transfiguration. Now, right before this passage, Jesus had just told his disciples one of the most difficult sayings of Christ. This is what he says a little bit earlier in chapter 9. He says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily, and follow me, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And then we come to our passage here about the transfiguration. Now, about eight days after saying these things, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Jesus uh, reveals his glory as he meets with these two Old Testament prophets. And these guys are, are the heavy hitters. These guys, these are the top of the list of prophets, Moses and Elijah. And what do they talk about with Jesus? What is it that they discuss? They discuss his exodus which is the Greek word for departure. They discuss his exodus, and then it says this. Then This is what Luke records for us. They spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. The departure, the exodus that Jesus was to accomplish in Jerusalem was not that he would leave, that he would make his own exit, that he would escape but that he would be the one who would provide the exodus for his people, that he would provide the deliverance that we need, that he would accomplish redemption. As he goes to the cross and he pays the penalty for our sin, he sets us free from the curse, and he gives us hope, and he gives us joy. In his 
work of salvation, in his work of providing the exodus, leading captives in his train. And those are us. He leads us in victorious procession as he leads us out of the exodus (coughs) of our struggles, of our difficulties, and as he grounds us in himself, as we find him, as we are hidden in him. What he accomplished for us is that we're no longer separated from God by our sin. We're no longer isolated. We're no longer on our own, but we're brought into the family. We're brought into his kingdom. And so as we, as we wrap up today, as we finish this opening chapter of the book of Exodus, our, our, our look at God's plan of redemption of his people, don't, don't be too quick. When, when the trials come, when the temptations come, when the opposition come, comes, when the afflictions come, Don't be too quick to run or to hide unless you're running to Christ. Run to Christ, flee to Christ, find your life in Christ this year as you come into 2023. May this be the year where where you find growth in your dependence upon Christ because of the trials, because of the difficulties. And and, uh, one final thing, as as you go through 2023, my prayer for you is that, <clears throat> that God would use every trial, every affliction that he brings into your life for your good, that he would grow you, that he would, that he would be magnified in your life as you rest and depend upon him. And wouldn't it be great if you didn't have any affliction or any opposition or any trials this year. <laughs> Not likely to happen, but, but possible. God, we, we don't know. We don't know what God's going to bring in this year. But here, here's the thing. Wh- whatever God leads you into, your, your trials, your struggles, the opposition that we may face as a church or as a, as a covenant community, Uh, that you would be assured, first of all, where your hope lies, where your hiding place is in Christ. But then that you would be used by God, again, to spread that word abroad, to to bring that word to others. There, There will be people in your life who will go through much more difficult things than you will. And they need that word of encouragement. That na- they need that word of hope. They need to be pointed to Christ. So listen for those words. Um, as, you, as you meet and hang out with your neighbors this year, as you, as you get to know your neighbors better, they'll, they'll start to share with you those things that are troubling them. And you'll have opportunities to multiply, right? To multiply God's word. to to spread abroad the the word of Christ, the word of hope. Take it it in for yourself, but then give it out. Share it out. Don't be quick to run. Don't be quick to escape unless you're escaping in him. Let's pray. Lord, would you take uh, what we've talked about this morning, what you've revealed to us in your word, would you drive it deep into our hearts that we might live for you, that we might live with, uh, with anticipation, with excitement for what you are doing and what you will do in this next year, knowing that trials will come, knowing that trouble will come, but you are with us no matter what. And we rest in you. We look to your deliverance and we hide in you. In Jesus' name, amen.